I'm just excited, man. We've been on this little like vacation hiatus and I, I missed you a kill, man. I miss you too, buddy. I we were both in Italy. We're, we were both in Italy and I was in the North. He was in the South. Oh, wow. I, awesome. I couldn't, I couldn't convince uh, Nicole to make the trip down to Amalfi coast, no matter how much limoncello I could <laughs> offer her. Did you drink that stuff? Limoncello, meloncello, meloncello, meloncello was my, my favorite. Oh, really? It's just like sugary yeah. alcohol, eh? Yeah. Honestly, I just, I had an Aperol spritz just before recording this. So I swear <laughs> that like legitimately, I'm like, do I get gelato too? I don't know. I feel out of place <laughs> what to do now. And all the, all the food just tastes like shit compared to, uh, compared to Italy. Our box, I tried to make like spaghetti today and I was like, I can't eat this. This is garbage. This is, this is literal garbage. And, it tastes uh, like cardboard. It tastes like cardboard. And like the thing, it's just, food is just so fresh there, man. Like it's, uh. And you We're don't gain weight. Italy. You do We're not gain weight, you no matter how much you try. I literally had a gelato every single day without fail, or yeah. a dessert, or something, and I did not gain a pound. <laughs> oh, I'm with you, Matt. James, have you been to Italy? I haven't yet. What? What do you do, man? I know. Take I... a week off. Go tomorrow. <laughs> I've been too You'll busy think... changing the world. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Here we go. Here we go. Today on the pod, we have Dr. James Younger. Tell us about yourself, man. Where'd you go to school? Where'd you graduate? And uh, how long have you been in dentist for? Yeah, thanks. And also, can I mention, super excited to be here. So thanks for having me on and, and spending some time with me. I was really looking forward to this. Uh, big fan of the podcast. And I was I was listening to some old episodes and things like that. So uh, really great. Who's your favorite uh, host, me or Akil? Oh, don't ask that. You're going to hurt my feelings. <laughs> Here are my feelings. I don't know where this is going. Magical chemistry together, I'll say. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, what sorry, was our man. nickname? Bra- was was the Brown Thunder? No. <laughs> <laughs> where did you call us? <laughs> I forgot what the nickname was. There was something. I forget what it was now. Brown Thunder. Eh? <laughs> I feel a, like that's an offensive term. I don't know why. That has an it ominous ring to it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're allowed to say that these days. That's so, uh... yeah, kidding. That's getting good. Dark That's after food. the Italian meals. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My first meal back. Yeah. <laughs> My first yeah. processed meal back. <laughs> oh, God. James, what's your story, man? <laughs> Before we get into trouble. Sure, yeah. Uh, so practicing dentist of 25 years now, 24 years. Graduated in 1999. You, you still work every day? Uh, no, I practice uh, one day every two weeks at a mental health hospital, and I do volunteer dentistry at a clinic for homeless people who don't have access to dental care. So still wow. full all in. I've owned a dental practice that I started from scratch. I also had taken over back in 2010. I I ran a very comprehensive, uh, high-end aesthetic, full mouth reconstruction clinic. Uh, I do implants, bone grafting, sinus lifts, uh, all the all the good stuff. And I love clinical dentistry since starting Tempstars and as busy as that's gotten, I've had to step away from the actual ownership of running businesses uh, from a dental standpoint. But still, I, th- I don't think there'll be a day that I don't love practicing dentistry and working on patients. So I've got kind of a nice mix right now. I'm still able to take care of people in need and treat people with uh, some mental health challenges and, and uh, people with uh, limited access to care. So that's a really good place to be and still kind of work on, the com- on Tempstars as well. Do they, uh, um, like, which organization do you volunteer with? Is it Filling the Gap? Yeah, Filling the Gap. That's right. Yeah, with Sanj, hey? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Amanda yeah. Marley started Sanj Mohanta. And... She's she's just uh, one of the stars of the pod. Uh, Honestly. Akil and she... I both, both love her. Yeah, and off the pod. Uh, she's absolutely amazing. <laughs> she, and she's a good pod. person off the pod, too. <laughs> yeah. She's always she's... giving. She's always looking for opportunities to help out and give back, 100%. Totally, man. No, that's, uh, that's absolutely amazing. Good for you. Like, did you, do you, do you miss clinical dentistry? Like, like running the office, not so much the actual dentistry, but do you, do you miss like the, the, like being able to grow an office or, or I what about love it? it. And, and I think that, so when I came up with this idea for temp stars and I decided to pursue it and I ended up selling my, uh, cosmetic practice, uh, you would think on one hand, you'd say, oh, that, why did you take such a risk? What if it didn't happen? But to me, I didn't see it as a risk because I love 
owning a dental practice. I love leading a team. I love growing business and, and a dental practice. So I just thought, well, if I'm barking up the wrong tree and this thing completely fizzles out, I will happily go back, buy another dental practice, start another dental practice, all of those sorts of things. So I've loved it. And anybody who owns a dental practice knows there's a blessing and a curse balance there because there's a lot of exciting things. And I love setting the direction and the mission and vision and the culture and the team and all of those sorts of things. But it comes with it a lot of other uh things that are challenges to handle it and that sort of thing. So I miss a lot of it, but I even miss the challenges sometimes as well. So I had sometimes thought about getting back into owning a dental practice, but TempSource is keeping me so busy these days. I don't know if I'd be able to fit that in. So what exactly is TempStars? So back in 2015, and this is literally how it happened. Uh, I, for a series of a few weeks, it was not uncommon that at four o'clock in the morning, I was getting a text message from one of my dental hygienists who was sick or their family was sick or they couldn't come in and four o'clock in the morning, text message. I can't come in eight o'clock patients booked and an immediate and visceral, not in my stomach, right? Because uh, I, what do I do? Do I, who, nobody's at the office at this point, who's calling patients. And this is back in 2015. We didn't have remote access to schedules or anything like that. So it was just a, this immediate knot in my stomach, super stressful. And I thought there has to be a way that I could use my phone to alert somebody who might be available that could come and take the shift. And, and it was a, just a very organic thought at the time. Uh, and uh, so I just, I went to Staples, I bought some grid paper, I bought some pencils, and I just started drawing rectangular screens that looked like iPhone sort of and drawing out buttons and things. And I thought, okay, well, if I needed somebody, I would say when I needed somebody and I would post and I'd hit this button and it would alert people. And it was really funny because it's hard to imagine, but in 2015, there was no Uber around in, in Ontario. And so when I would tell people the idea, they'd say, is that like Uber? And I'd say, I don't know what Uber is. Uh, if you think, if you say it's like Uber, maybe it is, but I don't know what that is. Um, and so it was really neat because I was in the early, it was the early years of what would become the model of two-sided marketplace platforms. There's some that existed at the time, but it was very early in terms of kind of crystallizing those as concepts. And so, yeah, so launched it in 2017. Uh and if to make a, a short story long, I'll tell you a little bit uh, that maybe is helpful to anybody from an entrepreneurial standpoint. Um, the very first version that I drew with pencils, I took to a, an app developer in, in Utah and I said, can you build this? And it was like I had drawn a house on a napkin with smoke coming out of the chimney and I'd gone to a home builder and said, can you build my home? And they said, oh yeah, we can. But what did I draw? What did I design here? I didn't know what I was doing. And so that first version took a year and a half, tens of thousands of dollars. And at the end of it, I threw it all in the garbage and didn't even tell anybody I had built an app because it was a mess. Uh... And But at the time I realized it would have been tempting to blame the developers, but I at least had the insight to say, this is my pro this is my fault. I didn't know what, I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know what I'm doing. And so as I was realizing this is gonna be a disaster, I taught myself, full stack web development, UI, UX design, database architecture, <laughs> uh, all of the things, rapid prototyping, all of the things I would need to communicate and build this thing, not on my own, but to have the right tools to communicate to somebody else so they could build it efficiently. And so, yeah, so that first version, I scrapped it. I found a full stack developer. I built my own working prototype exactly the way I'd wanted it done. And I designed the database architecture originally, and I gave it to a developer. And the second version that I actually launched took six weeks instead of 18 months and garbage. So you learned how to make an app. Yeah. So like, would you read like, like, is there a YouTube video for this or like how the hell was, do you learn? Yeah, it was pretty extensive uh, training. Like I took, a, it was all online courses. I didn't go to, uh, you know, an educational facility for this, but I just dug in and I obsessively took full stack web development and HTML and CSS and JavaScript and Node.js and MySQL and going through all what? of the different. Yeah. You're a freaking and, genius, man. Well, I, so I've always really liked computers. So I enjoyed the process as well, but I never was delusional enough to think that I would actually build it myself, but I realized the gap. And my problem was I didn't know how to envision and communicate properly with the person or people who could build it. Yeah. And I'll tell you that has served me a million times over through this process because 
Now we, I have a very close working relationship with our developer. I, up until recently, I would build my own prototypes and spec out my own designs. And I would design the database if we were building out a new feature and I would work with the coder that way. And it also helped me in the early days, I couldn't afford a full-time coder. And uh, I kept having to interview new coders on like five hours a week. And if you don't know what you're talking about with uh, developers and engineers and coders, it's a minefield and they will very much pull the wool over your eyes about how long things take and how expensive they can be. And so for me to be able to vet out and interview and find good people, even just that in and of itself was super valuable for me to, to have spent the time to pick, pick up that skill. I, I'm honestly, man, I'm speechless. You're like the, the Steve jobs of dentistry. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It, like, that's it, that's wild, man. Like how, like that. Akil, could you imagine like, cementing veneers one day <laughs> and then at night i'm just gonna pick up this like you know thousand page textbook and start learning how to code and then like trying to practice dentistry trying to run a practice like i i have massive respect for you james i don't think i've ever heard of a dentist actually trying like i've heard of so many dentists like coming up with app ideas and software but like they always they're hiring someone just like you did out of utah right and then exactly. it never tends to go the way that they want it to it, yeah. And, you know, it kind of goes back to early on one of my, and and but even before the app development, um, there's a really fundamental book that I had read probably 30 times called The E-Myth Revisited. And it has a lot of really core key business concepts in it. And one of them is the concept of delegating something versus abdicating something. And if you abdicate something, it means I don't know anything about this. I hope you can do a good job. And I won't really be able to judge if you do a good job or not, but I hope you know what you're doing. And so that's not a great way to do it versus delegating where I know enough about this. I know what should be done. I know how to measure success in this. I don't quite have the skill set, so I'm going to properly delegate it to somebody that I can communicate and explain and judge success and evaluate the process and have an intelligent conversation about it. And so I've always, always, since really delving into those concepts, that's where I gravitate. There's nothing... <laughs> that I do that I don't know something about to communicate with the person who's doing it about, whether that all the way down to finance and bookkeeping and like everything. I, I'm not the expert at it, but I can have good conversations about it. And if I don't know anything about it and I'm getting somebody to do it, I'm a, I just learn it really fast. So James, I, this is, this, like this point comes so key to me right now, because I used to be, I still am like the worst micromanager. I'm like, man, yeah. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to order this sticker for this. Right. It's like, and I have a team of 40 people that could do it for me. Right. But I feel like I'm like, if you want something done right, Nick, you do it yourself. Right. And that's yes. obviously the worst attitude. And then there was this book, I forgot what it was called. Something, something lazy CEO. And it was oh, yeah, like, how to be a lazy CEO. And it essentially said, you have a team of people around you. And if they can do the job at 70% as good as you can do it, delegate it. Yeah, I agree. Is that, do, you, do, you, do you think 70%? I think that's pretty low. And that's like the micromanager in me is just like, man, right. come on, 70%. Like that's, that's a fail, man. Like, come on. We're trying to run like the way we want it to. At what percentage would someone have to do a, as good of a job as you for you to delegate it? Well, I, I just kind of fall back to the classic 80-20 and even for myself, because first of all, let's separate clinical dentistry and, you know, tenths of a millimeter of success versus not success, where that is the right way to be and the, and the margins of veneers and crowns yeah. and endo, all of those things. So that definitely, but the 80-20 rule for me is we, I always think, and we as a team always think in iterations where and I have a saying for the whole team, and this is going back to early days, the bread is never baked. We're never done. So you, we never have to worry about designing this thing with such emotional investment that we hope when the bread comes out, everyone loves our baby. And if they don't, we're going to be heartbroken. We just, It's just always iterative. And there's another opportunity for revisiting and refining it. And so for the 80-20, the more cycles of 80-20 or to your point, 70-30 that you can go through, the more learning you get. So if you're delegating it to somebody and they're 70-30, but you give them the confidence and the ability and the structure and the vision of success for that, if, and allow them to learn and iterate through that 70, 30 process, they will get up to that higher level of that you'd be happy with. But you also have to have the patience and the trust that people, I mean, my goodness, if I don't make 10 mistakes a day, I'm not doing the right thing. So to have the patience with people that still are the right people and in the right seats, but to have that 
patience and support to allow them to make those mistakes and to say, this is kind of 60. Uh, I know, <laughs> let's revisit this. And, and this is what we could have done better. And maybe next time we're taking a swing at this thing, this will get us to the 80% sort of thing. But to me, it's just a constant process. So I'm never, aside from clinical dentistry, uh, the perfection is not the pursuit. It is what are we trying to do right now? And what is the bar for what is going to accomplish the thing we're doing now? And it's not an excuse for shoddy work, but it means there's another thing to do right after this. And then we're going to have another swing at this thing. So let's just get it done to the bar that we need it done and let's keep moving. Yeah, you made a really phenomenal point about in 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 dentistry and in business, you're, you're working two completely separate parts of your mind that are often not even unrelated but they're you know opposed to each other right because in dentistry you can't make 10 mistakes a day that would be a pretty bad right. day right yes, exactly so what would you suggest a dentist because it feels like nowadays every dentist wants to do something outside of dentistry right it seems like you know i feel like we're we're on the brink of this like massive exodus of of, of dentists and, and you know a lot of dentists are burning out and uh and a lot of them you know go to entrepreneurship what would your biggest piece of advice be other than, you know, don't chase perfection uh, be for a dentist that's looking to sort of switch careers? Yeah. I mean, from an entrepreneurial slant. So one thing about, so I read books obsessively and multiple, multiple, multiple times. And so early on uh, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, the lean startup was a classic. Um, yeah. If I hadn't delved as deeply into the idea of entrepreneurship as I did, I would have thought that these first few, you know, mess ups were terrible, right? But the more you realize and the more, and I'm a huge fan of how I built this by Guy Raz, which is all these stories of entrepreneurs and oh, how they- yeah, that uh, podcast, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, and wicked. So, and just really like top-notch entrepreneurs on there, people that you'd know of in the companies. But yeah. when you hear about these humble beginnings of how they messed up and just kept pursuing through and learning from it and iterating on things. And, and you know, you also have to pick something that you're passionate enough to solve as you get punched in the stomach a hundred times with all these mistakes too, right? Because you pick something that you think, oh, this will be something that'll make money for me on it. And it should, but it's easy to give up on something through all of the hardships, especially in those early days when you're trying to figure things out. But I mean, there's that fail fast, fail early and fail cheap so that you can just keep learning and iterating rather than making a giant haymaker swing at this thing and hoping that it's the thing that does it. You've got to take small bites and just learn from those iterations and learn from the wins associated with those iterations and redirect constantly. So what is it in Tempstars in particular? Because in dentistry, when it comes to purpose, we're super, 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 super lucky. Anything in healthcare is super lucky because your mm. purpose is to help, right? There's no more noble purpose than that, which is to help someone else. How do you find that in entrepreneurship, like in particular temp stars? Because there's a spin on it where you can kind of say, oh, it's kind of lower impact. I don't agree that it's lower impact, but you can make that argument that, you know, from afar saying that, you know, placing, you know, staff is different than using your two hands to heal right? So to speak, I'm playing devil's advocate here, but how do you, how do you, you know, balance that? So I'm really glad no one's actually ever asked me that before, but I love talking about this aspect of it too. So when your head is down and you've got an idea for an app and all you want is first of all, the thing to be built, and then you want the thing to work. And once it works, you just want people to use it. And then once you have people using it, you want more people to use it, right? So you get to this point where you've got a working app and a bunch of people are using it and it's growing. So for me at that point, it was a lot about what is driving, what is our purpose and what is the vision that we're trying to make. And I know that sounds like kind of poster on the wall talk, but it's very genuine and authentic things to what I think about. So when I think about the problems and the frustrations in dentistry and the problem I was trying to solve, it was immediately the empathetic desire to remove that knot in the stomach from dental office owners and managers that I was getting all the time if somebody was sick and I had to deal with it. And why can't there be a fast, easy way so that if somebody's sick, I don't have a knot in my stomach for three hours. I can just say, oh, I just have the solution. So this is the thing. And you just can easily go to that. On the flip side of things, for all of the dental hygienists and dental assistants and the dental professionals that I know personally and have worked with who might be frustrated at work, or maybe they have a boss they don't like, 
and they're being treated poorly and disrespected at work, but they have bills to pay and they're stuck in their situation and things like that. For me, this was also a way to help empower dental professionals and help them find better opportunities for work where they feel like they found their work home. So it really and genuinely is me, for me, the impact and the good that we're doing is about helping everybody in dentistry be happier at work. And so if it's office managers and owners who are looking to hire good people to their team to find good matches, to me, that's big because I know what it's like when you're looking for a good team member, or maybe you've made a mishire and you're like, oh, now what I do, that sort of thing. So there's that element of it, that stress and frustration and finding team members who are engaged with the culture of your office and things like that from the dental professional side about finding people and who you work with that makes it feel like you're at your work home and you fit in with the team and the culture and the vision of what that practice is doing. And then I'm going to elevate that even further because one of the things about Tempstars, and if, you know, I sometimes I write articles or, or interviews or things like that, I care about bringing the inspiration and the resources for dental office owners and managers to be better managers, more effective leaders and more inspiring leaders, and for dental professionals to be more engaged in contributing members of a team. So if I can spread that message far and wide, and sometimes I'm shouting into the wind, but that's the impact that I care about making is just bringing that to the work lives of people. And the happier dental professionals are at work, the better that reflects on patient care. And so that's that's me making the world a better place through this, this element of my impact. And it's a real, like, it's not a story I just made up. I think about those things on a daily and weekly basis about the impact that we're making. Yeah, because it's it's all about the team, man. And and I hear that. And I I feel like I, I feel like you are genuine about that and, and you have created a purpose outside dentistry. But I, I just want to take it back one thing because I've been dying to ask you this question. Mm-hmm. How do you know when you're ready to like sell your practice and go all in on your side hustle? I think that's different for everyone. For me. And and it probably is, I have certain personality slants. <laughs> I love that term you use, slants. Sorry. <laughs> it's the second time you've used it. It's a really great, uh, it's a really good say. Slants. But it, Sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean well, to interrupt. I, I just always have ideas. And so sometimes things grip me. And so I couldn't, you know, I would wake up in the night and write down ideas. I was so excited about what Tempstars could do and build. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I thought, if I'm working full time doing clinical dentistry at my office and trying to figure out if this thing will work and it doesn't work, then I won't know if it could have worked. And so for me, it was that leap of dedication and and inspiration, but also I had set myself little, uh, I guess, milestones to hit where I would just say, look, if this thing doesn't do this thing by this time, you're barking up the wrong tree. Just, you just give up. And I would just tell myself like, it's fine. If that's a signal, just go back and do clinical dentistry, buy another practice. And so I would set myself little signals. And every time I'd set a signal, it would surpass what I wanted to achieve in that time. And to me, that was an encouraging signal to keep going. But for quite a while, especially in the first year, you just don't know, especially when you're building a marketplace platform that requires a network effect, you don't know if it's going to take off. So I had to set myself kind of realistic milestones to achieve to as a reality check to know if I'm onto something or not. Cause like, man, I feel like I wear these golden handcuffs. <laughs> like honestly, every single time I go into work, I, I love my job. Don't get me wrong. I love my job. I choose to go to work, but like every single time I step foot in that clinic, I'm like, I'm choosing to go here instead of trying to pursue another Avenue. Like it's mm-hmm. a conscious decision to go to work every day. And I feel as dentists, especially anyone in our profession, we got these handcuffs that say we make a great living. Mm-hmm. It's easy to go to work. It's easy to go to work. It's easy to, you know, rinse, repeat the next day. I think you have big cojones selling your practice and going all in, in an idea. And I commend you. I so commend you because I wish I had that ability. There's even to make, I want to make another course, but I'm going to have to take, like I did my last course during COVID. I had a year off. It was phenomenal. Like, man, COVID was the best. I hate to say COVID was so great for me yeah, um, because I had time, right? Now right. I have no time. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to say, you probably thought the same thing because you got all, you could put your nose to the grind and develop something, no? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. I don't know, man. I, I, I have a hard time. I wish I, I wish I could just turn it off and go, but I just, how do you deal with that, man? Maybe there's two things that might be helpful. One was 
I did actually go through a tiny bit of an identity crisis when I sold my practice. Because when you run a big, busy practice and you're doing big, important things, everyone's asking all the questions and you're the guy that goes to, and then you're not doing that. And now you're just like, hum, you should see, I was literally working out of a scrapbook, right? And I was on the bus going to a co-working space to work on things and talk to other entrepreneurs who had these startup ideas. So it's a slight definite shift and redefinition of what your identity is for, for me, it was in the short term, but there was that element of it. Um, but also, and I know different people live different lifestyles and things like that, but I live quite humbly, very good. And, and I'm not suggesting anybody who doesn't, doesn't, but my family life is fantastic, really happy and content. I don't have uh, necessarily an extravagant lifestyle. So that at the same time, probably allowed me some cushion and tolerance for you know, just like you said, you take off the golden handcuffs uh, a bit and, you know, Tempstar's made zero money in the first in yeah. the first year kind of thing, right? So, you know, maybe, it, yeah, there's definitely a risk factor to it, but I knew that if something happened, I loved dentistry, good at running a dental practice. I did have, and as funny as it sounds as a safety net, that was kind of my safety net that I knew that I could go back to. So when you were in that process, who did you look to for um, guidance or, you know, you mentioned other entrepreneurs. Did you have a business coach? Did you have a mentor? Did you have a group of friends? Yeah. So luckily, um, and, and probably I'm sure throughout North America, but there's, you know, kind of, uh, incubator hubs and technology startup communities. I've heard of this term incubator. What is that? Well, I guess the idea is if you have a bit of a startup idea or a prototype or some kind of minimal viable product that you have as an idea, you can apply to an incubator and the incubator is kind of a community with mentors and coaches kind of baked into it that help you and drive you to push your idea to the next thing with the expectation that the mentors have experience in that, but also have connections to series A, you know, seed funding and all of those different things. So it's, it's a community. Often you move there for incubators, but not always. And I know like Ryerson has a really effective one, but there's one near me in Oakville um, and it's called Haltech and they're just fantastic there. It's free. You have to apply to it, but if your idea is, you know, worth its salt, get in and it's coaching, mentorship, connections, networking. They do free seminars, all of these it's different free. things. Yeah. Like, are they like expecting to get a piece of your company or like, why, like, what's, what's the, come on, nothing's free these days. Like, why, why would well, they do that? Some of them would, I'm sure definitely some incubators, they, you know, give us 5% of the company and you join our incubator, but yeah. there's a lot of really well government funded programs. And this is just a, a government innovation program really? that, that supports a lot of these innovation hubs and, you know, their, their agencies. And of course they have reporting to the government to say, you know, we have this many entrepreneurs and they're at this stage. And of our group of entrepreneurs, they managed to raise $400 million in aggregate. So they have, you know, they have metrics to show and things like that for what they're accomplishing for the government. But fantastic, supportive, free, like very high level mentorship and guidance that I had through many processes and, and also mentorship in different fields. So if I was in an area of like, I need financial forecasting, like, oh, you got to talk to David. He's fantastic. He's an ex uh, public markets analyst. So he can help you with that. Or I need help with sales. Oh, you got to talk to this guy. He's the head of the sales department for this big fortune 500 company kind of thing. So so very, yeah, wow. nothing. Yeah, I could never have done it without kind of the connections and support of people I was seeking out and, and worked with and got to know. Hey, to bring it back to the last point you made um, and, and Neki's question about when you know to turn your side hustle into your main hustle. Um, do you find as an idea person, because I think I'm going to make this assumption and correct me if I'm wrong. I think all three of us are, are very much ideas people. Like we have ideas bouncing yes. around in our brain all day. Um, yeah. it, it, it's kind of counterintuitive when it comes to starting something because to be an ideas person is kind of, I listen to this podcast with people in lab about creativity and it's kind of like you could have, you need both convergent and divergent creativity. Divergent meaning you need to have, you know, something like, suppose you, you, you see a car. From that car, you need to have divergent thinking in order to, you know, think of, okay, what in that car can I innovate? Maybe the rims, maybe. So you have to have mm -hmm. this like kind of unique divergent thought process, but then that thought process has to converge into something useful, right? Because if you just have divergent thinking or divergent thinking, you're going to end up in Narnia, right? So you need to have mm -hmm. some point of convergence where you kind of say, okay, 
I'm going to focus on the rim. And then now I'm going to hone in on the rim rather than going from the rim and then having squirrel syndrome and then going to the right. engine and then yes. going from that to the paint. How did you flip your brain once you got to temp stars because you have a million ideas? How did you know that was the one, not one of the other ideas? Yeah, that's a really good, hmm. I guess it was that it felt like such an interesting and meaty and deep thing to bite into that had so many squirrel ideas option embedded in it to work with. Now, that being said, I have 10, ide 10 ideas that have nothing to do with temp stars and nothing to do with dental temping and hiring. And of course, my brain thinks that ever I see somebody doing something or I see something, I think, oh, I have this great idea for that. But even right now within Tempstars, there's so much room for innovation and ideas and being the uh, the leaders in the space from a technology standpoint, from a design standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, and all of those things I love. Each one of those hits a button in my brain about coming up with a new marketing campaign or marketing copy, or here's a different channel we could use, or, oh, and I still love doing prototypes. So we're working on a new signup flow. So I get to be creative about thinking some, what kind of thinking about somebody working through our signup flow. So there's still ideas, but I guess, they're now housed within a sphere of the Tempstars world kind of thing. How many users do you guys have? We have, I think we work with about 8,500 dental offices and like 20,000 hygienists. 8,500? Yeah. What? Offices? They're all over. Yeah. Like all, all over North America or all over Canada? We're, yeah, we're in seven U.S. states as well. Um, oh my goodness we just had a press release go out last week or the week before we've completed over five hundred thousand hours of dental temping shifts really? and the people who use our platform as er have earned over 28 million dollars in temping income at this point that's the wow. convergent thinking <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, awesome it's, that's wicked it's, that's so so it's, cool it's pretty big yeah that's Very that's novel. amazing hey i got a question for you from like uh like an entrepreneurial point of view, how do you not think about money? Like when you're when you're starting out and you want to grow something, you start at zero and then you mm -hmm. go into the negatives. Big time. Yeah. Like let's be honest, you go into the negatives. Yes. And then maybe you'll start making money. But then like if you want to grow more, say you need a great marketing plan, like you just said, right? Mm -hmm. or, and everything costs money. How do you decide whether to invest in a marketing plan or in anything versus grow your business? Like at what point are you like, okay, now it's time to, now it's time to collect a reward, not just keep on investing in this thing. Yeah. And, and again, I think that's different for everyone, but I'll tell you in the early days of, of me and Tempstars, <laughs> I'll tell you what's, what made it happen was. I just did everything. I didn't pay anybody to do. I did all of our marketing, all of our social. I, I, and I wasn't fantastic at it, but I'm a fast learner and, and did it well enough to get us grown and profitable. And then once we get profitable, we I start to think, well, where can I invest this amount of profit, this amount of profit? Okay, marketing is probably a big thing because that's taken up a lot of my time. And we just recently brought on a, a world-class product manager to help us with user experience design and things like that. But I guess that... To your point, I think of it sometimes like an apple orchard, right? Where if you eat all the apples on the first tree, you don't really get an orchard. And so, in the, especially in the early days, the fewer apples you can eat and the more you can plant, the bigger your orchard gets. And then it multiplies and has an exponential effect that way. So I really do think in those terms, because I find it so rewarding to do what I'm doing and to focus on the things that are helping Tempstars grow and to serve the people we're serving, I don't like the actual idea of a significant income and wealth and things like that to me isn't the focus it may end up being the outcome of focusing all the right things but you know it was just a few weeks ago i was talking to somebody about a similar idea that you could have a dental practice and focus on your bottom line revenue and your monthly goals and that's one way to look at it but if you only focus on really providing really really good patient care scheduling efficiency and all of the different systems in place and providing great treatment and all of the smart things if that's your focus the money will come from that versus thinking about the money and figuring out how to get it and so that's kind of how i think about it is if we're doing all the right things and solving all the problems and providing the value and and addressing pain points in the dental profession and doing it efficiently and smartly and 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 economically then all of those other good things just follow that focus, I guess. 
I don't know if that answers your question. Was that? No, it, it totally does. I'm because like it, we we always have ideas, and they often let's be honest, ninety five percent of ideas go in the shitter. Um, yeah, they never but, make it out of the shower. Yeah, right. They become yeah, brown thunder. You, yeah, right. <laughs> nice. when you when you start like trying to build something, and then like you see it go somewhere, you're like, at what point should I really invest in this thing, or at what point should I just be like, okay, just let it run? You know what I mean? So at least in technologies, there's a thing called product market fit, right? Which means you have a benchmark of a certain number of people do a certain action within a certain amount of time. Like 70% of people do this thing within this amount of time. And you have these benchmarks to say, I've established what's called product market fit, which means I'm solving a problem that people need and want solved in a consistent and predictable way. So that's kind of this. So for me, it was just a bunch of fumbling around in the dark until I landed, because really, I mean, it took me 15 updates of Tempstars within the first two months to finally stop thinking the thing was done. Because mm -hmm. when I launched it, I only launched it to some dentists I knew and some hygienists I knew and asked them to try it out. And I said, this thing's terrible. <laughs> and, uh, like, okay, that's fantastic. What's the most terrible thing about it that I should fix first, right? So I did not have product market fit in the early days, but as it started to grow and there was consistent repeat usage and the stickiness and things like that, that's when I knew I could invest in it um, and kind of, pursue it that way but it, it there yeah so i kind of use that as a as a guidepost for knowing when it was worth uh kind of doubling down on it the, the reason i ask this is james you're my hero like no joke <laughs> i know i know i don't know you very well like i met you before but like you're my hero because you chased you chased your your side hustle and you sh you showed the rest of us dentists because we all have ideas that like if you really want it, go for it. And yeah, I think I think you're a very rare person because we we don't see it. We all have these ideas that we want to practice because we have these handcuffs five days a week. We can't give that up, but we'll pursue these side hustles on the weekend. But we'll, we're going to half-ass it, and it's not never going to grow into anything we want it to. It's always going to be the what if because we have these handcuffs. And um, but you did it, man, and, and I think that's just so commendable. Well, thanks. I don't. I don't know about being called a hero. And uh, at the same time, I think about the factors that led to making it. And people would say, oh, I wish I had the Tempstars idea. And my response is always, if you knew what it took to get this thing off the ground, you would thank the Lord you did not have this idea. Because yeah. it is, you know, for, I there was, it's funny to say for weeks, for weeks, month, months, I would wake up in the morning, first thing, pour a coffee, and I would go down and I would hit the heavy bag just to pump myself up. I'm like, you're doing that. Like, yeah. like classic cheesy, like you get to work and you make this happen. That was my self-talk. Like I needed to make it happen. And so it didn't come, like there was just a lot of hard work and dedication and focus and failing forward and perseverance and all of those things. So if somebody has that idea that gives them those feelings, then hundred percent, I would say, do what you can to, to make it happen. What's your approach or what was your approach? Was it a, um, because I've seen it done a million times in terms of how people attack problems. Was yours a, I have this idea. Let me see what the TAM is, the total adjustable market. Now let me put a business plan together. Now let me, you know, do a couple of, you know, AB tests. Or was it just, I intuitively feel there's a problem here and I'm going to just go for it and just start developing. It, yeah, it was very much that. It was not, it was not a well thought out plan in the beginning. It was, I think this needs solving and I feel like I'm well positioned to solve it and I'm super excited about solving it. But then, you know, like I mentioned, I go to talk to these, uh, to mentors at innovation hubs or the finance uh, consultant and they're like, what's your, what's your TAM? I'm like, I don't even know what that is. I'm like, well, how do you know? How, how do you know how big this thing's going to be? I said, I don't know. I mean, people are excited and it's growing quickly. Like those are my answers early on. You have a business plan? No, there was, and I re would read a book called the one page business plan. So I wrote the one page business plan and the one, one page marketing plan and things like that. So it was very much a learn as I go, fail forward, brush myself off and, and keep going. And, and, and now I know, <laughs> I know most of those things. Uh, and, and I learn as I go, having worked with some pretty good and smart people to kind of bring me up to speed on all the things like that. So knowing what you know now, um, where would someone start? So we have an idea, mm -hmm. we, we know of an incubator, right? But like at what, like what's, what's step one? How do you get idea off the ground? 
Well, so in retrospect, how I didn't do it, but probably is worth pursuing is just crystallizing the idea and the problem it solves. And there's a classic, I don't know if it's actually two-pronged approach, but are you trying to invent an, is your idea a vitamin that will make people feel good? Or is it a painkiller that will solve a problem that is really, really bothering people? And they're both very successful, but for me, and I think think if you're good at solving problems and you've got a good pain point, that at least is a, I mean, I'm, I'm biased because that's the what direction I went. I didn't come up with a vitamin. I came up with a painkiller, but, and then as, as well as you can describe the problem space, right. And do actual ground level interviews, even if you, maybe you're in the industry, but you've got to go out and talk to people. Another interesting thing I learned early on is it's a much, much greater risk of not talking to enough people and spending your time in the wrong direction around the wrong thing than there is that someone's going to steal your idea. And so maybe there's some secret sauce you came up with that you don't necessarily want to spread around, but the more discussion, the more feedback and insight you can get in those early days by discussing your idea and being protective of whatever you feel the element you need to be protective of, but the more insights you can get, the better off you're going to be starting off in the right direction with what you're trying to do. But yeah, mapping out the the problem space, the solution space and things like that and what you're trying to do. And then whatever the, there's a, that concept of minimal viable product isn't necessarily an app. It's the smallest version of that thing that can start your learning. So even if it's a prototype, people build apps and I, I cringe. They're like, oh, I, I'm starting building this app. I've got this developer coding. I'm like, well, do you, have you built a prototype that people like to use yet? They're like, no. So now you're spending coding hours you're spending $100 an hour to figure out what your thing is going to look like when in one day you can learn how to make a prototype that works on someone's phone that you can change yourself, that you can cl click and tap on, and then you can know what it's supposed to do and look like, and you haven't paid any developers. And then you go to the developer and you're like, this works exactly the way I want. Can you make this happen kind of thing? So that's a, that is a big common problem, especially um, when I was talking to people early on in app development ideas. Don't spend money on, on a developer or engineer figuring out your your solution build it in a prototype yourself first that's the ux ui yeah absolutely ah uh, okay so use figma yeah. or one of those yeah platforms. Er yeah whoa, whoa 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 yeah what are you guys talking about what is that <laughs> <laughs> james you're the vet i just i just have an account <laughs> well so i use proto io but there are drag and drop prototyping software that is just as if not easier to use than like photoshop or illustrator or canva where you just drag an L you drag a button here you change the button color and then you do, then you make a duplicate of that screen and you draw a little arrow between that button and that screen and it just and then you can install it on your phone and it's not actually connected to a database or a backend but it works yeah. and you can visually you can design it exactly like the app that you want to build uh -huh. and because it's fast and easy and drag and drop and you don't have to pay somebody hundred dollars to do it you can literally show it to someone and they're like I don't know what this button does you're like okay let, <laughs> back to the drawing board for a minute tap 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 drag 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 okay what about now what do you think of it now kind of thing so that if if anybody's coming up with an app idea, that's probably the most valuable uh, advice I could get. I didn't even man, this is great. I didn't know that even existed. Yeah, it's it's a lifesaver, and even for me as a communications tool, I, I still use it if I want uh, our developer to build something. I will make a clickable prototype to, uh, just as a communication tool to say, "Do you see how when I'm clicking here, it does this? Can you make it do that, but look better?" <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. So James, you're did did I hear you right? You're 25 years out of dental school, right? Yeah, twenty. Yeah, graduated ninety nine. Okay, so you're you're almost twenty five years out of dental school. Did the James of nineteen ninety five? Okay, so you graduated ninety nine, right? So your first yep. year dental school. Would you ever in a million years think you would be running a company like Tim Stars instead of doing veneers or mos and dos? Like, say yes. I I think. I think James of 1995, no, but when I look back, so I, when I graduated in 99, I moved out to Calgary for a year and probably I associated out there. And when I think back, so I made a website in 1999 when Google was in its infancy called findmeadentist.net. And if you go in the Wayback machine on the internet, you can actually see some old versions of it. But it, the idea was I used a flatbed scanner to scan in a map of uh, Calgary, and then I hand traced it with, with uh, graphic software, and then built a website that if you moved to Calgary and you were looking for a dentist, you would type in your postal code, and it would give you a list of dentists in the area. And then I was going around to dentists saying, "Hey, do you want a listing in this website?" 
and it was doomed to fail because Google was coming and all of these other great things were coming. But I really like that kind of stuff. I like idea stuff. I like coming up with like kind of figuring things out. So I guess that guy who did that probably had some inkling that maybe there'd be a technology uh, business or solution in the future, maybe. Your Google ads before Google ads. Yeah. And I even had, I had campaigns. I have my dental assistant uh, at the, at this associate. She had, I made her put a bunch of uh, re- like uh, gauze in her mouth and tie the thing around her head. And I took a photo and we had this ad campaign ready to say, looking for a dentist uh, kind of thing. Cause everybody was moving to Calgary at the time. The the population yeah. was exploding. So they needed to find that de- anyways. So that was my early foray into kind of figuring out some kind of weird website business. That's just, uh, this, is, this is just nuts, man. Like, uh, I, <laughs> I just can't believe this. Um, James, if someone wanted to, I guess, dive into the entrepreneurial mindset that, that you're at right now, you said you read a, a bunch of good books. Like you said, mm-hmm. E-Myth re, you said E-Myth re, Revisited, right? Yeah. E-Myth Revisited. Yeah. What, what else like kind of sparked your interest or kind of is your go-to? So some of the, uh, Ema three visited was big. The lean startup was big. Um, and then, so, and then it was just a lot of online courses I had taken and things like that, because luckily there's a lot of online resources from a marketing standpoint. There's a really good book called building your story brand that applies to dental offices. And- that's a phenomenal book. Don- Donald Miller, man. I think that's, that book kind of changed my, uh, my thinking on almost everything right because everything's about a story and yeah. sanj and i were talking about this incidentally like coincidentally enough um yeah yeah if if you don't have a story you might as well just pack up your uh pack up your business because it's not going anywhere absolutely yeah yeah i read the, the review of that book when i was looking at it it's one person left a review that said life-changing and i thought uh, i think i better read this one yeah <laughs> And, and it was a, a very eye-opening from a marketing and, and using that framework really helped us get off the ground with Facebook ads and, and things like that. So that was really influential. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I just read a ton of books about leadership and now I'm reading, you know, books about go to market. And, and in the early days for me, it was all about platforms and two-sided marketplaces, which were in their infancy. So I had to read like research articles and math papers about platform dynamics and things like that. But for me now, now there's some decent books about platform uh, two-sided marketplaces and things like that. Damn, man. That's, that's so cool. Now, James, I'm going to ask you one last question here. Sure. And I ask everyone this, who, okay. who I know has been in the business world. I want tell me your biggest failure and, and why, like what, what happened? Yeah. Uh, it doesn't have to be about temp stars. Like, tell me, tell me about a, a big failure you had. Help, help make the people around you feel a little better. I'm trying to, how do I nail it down to one? Right? <laughs> because I, I just, I get to the point where you just, I just make so many mistakes and and what you, what a person could consider failure, but it's just a part of me moving forward. So, okay. I'll just tell you one, just a funny one that uh, in the early days of Tempstars, I was administering our own database and there was no interface for, for me changing accounts or anything. So I had to go in and change the database and I made a change to something, someone's account or something. And then all these emails come in, the platform. So anyways, I took down the entire system and and crashed it by just going in and thinking that I could make some easy change. And then I'm like on the developer, "Ah, our systems crashed, our systems crashed. And he's like, what did you do? I said, I didn't do anything. I just, I just changed this thing. And he's like, yeah, you corrupted the whole, (laughs) that change was linked to these 17 other things that caused a whole corruption. So nobody can now log in because it checks for all of those things, including the thing you just changed. So many examples like that. There was two years ago, every Sunday, our our system went down at 2 PM. And so I would just every, every Sunday at 2 PM, we could fix it, but we had other things we needed to do. So every day at 2 PM, I would, on Sundays, I would go in and reboot the system to keep it going. Uh... Damn, so man. anyways, just little, little things like that, that if you really care about what you're doing, you just see it as part of the moving success in progress is what I like to say. Yeah. Success in progress. Put that on a t-shirt next to Brown Thunder. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It was so, uh, it's so inspirational and refreshing to hear a story from someone who, uh, who like Nikki said, followed their dreams and, uh, and actually made it work. So uh, kudos to you, my friend. And uh, thanks for coming on. Honestly, guys, thanks for having me. This is 
been a pleasure. I love I love chatting with you guys and great energy and positivity. And yeah, it's been really great. So thank you. And getting it's been good getting to know you too. I just love this guy, Kill. He's such a good dude. He's just got a heart of gold. <laughs> I feel like you have like the IQ of like, I don't even know what a genius IQ is, but I feel like you have an extremely high IQ. <laughs> and it's 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 it you're very humble about it but i can yeah. just tell there's something back there it's like it's 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 you're you're uh you're a grower not a shower so <laughs> 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 well we'll leave we'll leave the audience with that all right everyone have a good uh have a good rest all of right week. see you later everyone. thanks everyone welcome to the hi i'm D- necky is that What's a sweater man? Yeah, dude. Dude, it's the Hi, I'm Doctor sweater. Oh, dude, I see you got yours on too. Looking sharp, bro. Dude, where'd you get yours from? Uh, it, it was super easy, man. I just went on to our website, www.hiimdoctor.com. That's H-I-I-M-D-R.com. We have a website. We must be raking in cash from swelling, selling these sweaters. Dude, we are killing it. I mean, if, if that includes losing money on every single sweater that we make, I, I think we're doing really well. Yeah, Neki and I are donating all proceeds, which is zero, to charity because we are losing money. <laughs> we're, so we're, I, I wonder if the charity will pay us. I think I think we got something here, man. Let's, let's keep on <laughs> let's keep, keep on losing money on every sweater. All righty, guys, go check us out. Hi, I'm Doctor. Com. See ya.